right, I guess we'll uh, get started. Are we are we recording? We're good. Okay. All right. Thank you um, all for being here today. Uh, my name is David Maldo, and today we're going to talk about the future of work, preventing home office burnout, and video fatigue. Um, I am, I've been a home office worker for 13 years now. I'm going to share some of what works for me. Um, but what works for me isn't going to work for everyone. This is more about a way of thinking about things than just a right way to do things. So before we get started, uh, let's thank the IMCCA. Our, or, um, our industry really needs an organization like the IMCCA that's kind of in between the vendors, in between the end users, analysts, and everyone else and kind of pulls everyone together. So we really need to do everything we can to support them. And please check them out at imcca.org. Uh, my name is David Maldo. I've been covering business communications as an analyst for 15, but it's more like 18 years now. I started at Wayne House Research, where I did the typical analyst work, the white papers, the product evals that I still do today. And at that time, I was commuting. I was doing the nine to five. Uh, then I shifted to telepresence options when telepresence was the biggest thing in the world uh, for our industry. And that's where I did a lot of writing. And almost 10 years ago, I founded Let's Do Video. And what am I today? Am I an analyst? I'm an influencer. Things are changing. I like to call myself, um, I, think so. I like to call myself a content creator because that's what I really love doing the most. I love writing. I love making videos. I love doing live streams. And if you go to letsdovideo.com, you'll see a bunch of my latest videos and, and content that I create. Um, and before, this is my second career, I'm actually very old, um, I was an attorney for 10 years in New Orleans, and I was a commuter, and I was a nine to five person. So I have seen both sides of, of the puzzle here. So let's get started. Where did everyone go? I have this beautiful big boardroom Okay, this is actually a virtual boardroom. I use this for a lot of my videos. I put my guests next to me, I zoom in, we put the content behind me, it's a fun show. But I think it represents the world today. We have all these beautiful empty meeting rooms. And yes, we're hearing some, some companies are trying to get people back to the office. Um, Meta, Mark Zuckerberg wants everyone back at the office. So there is some return to the office, but it's not gonna go back to how it used to be. We are going to be working at home. And there are some challenges working at home. It isn't, I'm a big fan of it. It's worked for me. I think it's a better way for us to work and live. But there are some challenges that we have to address. Before we get to the challenges, I want to just kind of take a step back and say that we should embrace it. I think we're having this discussion still, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing that we're all working remotely? It is a, a good thing in terms of personal freedom and in terms of productivity for work. Now, I, this image, I went to Google and I Googled Freedom. And this came up, this is Freedom Park in North Carolina. And I thought about, I love taking a walk in the park. Sometimes on a Tuesday afternoon at one o'clock, my wife will say, hey, let's take a walk. There's a park nearby, we love it. And if I'm not in the middle of something, I do it. But when I was a nine to fiver, I also loved going to the park and I never did. Because Monday through Friday, I'm working nine to five. Saturday, I'm doing my errands. I gotta get my dry cleaning. The dry cleaner closes at five. I can't do it during the week. So Sunday, maybe I go to the park, but that's my only day to do everything else. That's when I go to the movies. That's when I go to concerts. That's when I hang out with my friends. I'm, I'm having a one day a week life. And I, I feel bad for all these empty parks. And of course the park is symbolic. For you, the park might be taking your dog for a walk or spending time with your kids or playing guitar. But I don't think these things should be a one day a week thing. And also for, for sanity, the way we used to live our lives, we used to talk about um, work-life balance. Now we talk about work-life blend. I didn't like work-life balance. Work-life balance was I would get to work and I commuted. And I don't want to spend too much time, but commuting was the worst. I remember sitting there and thinking, this is, this is like being in limbo. I can't work, I can't enjoy my hobbies. I'm just sitting in a car for an hour and a half with all these other people, what a waste of time. But that aside, when I would get to work, I would flip this switch in my brain I'm not David anymore, I'm worker B number 50735. And I am going to just work. I'm not thinking about what I want to do. I'm getting work done from my boss till five o'clock. And then at five o'clock, I flick the switch back. Now I'm David again, oh, this is great. That's not, and so for some people that's great. I'm not saying everyone has to be like me. Some people say, I need that switch. I work best that way, I'm productive. Keep your switch, do nine to five. For me, it didn't work. And it wasn't just 
the freedom to be myself during the day. It was a freedom to think about work during the weekends. If something happened on a Saturday, I'm like, oh, I have a great idea for that project. No, wait, this is my time. I'm not working on my time. The boss isn't paying me. Forget that idea. If I remember it on Monday, good for me. It, wasn't, it just wasn't good for me. Now, as much as I like the new way of doing things, I work when I feel like working. I feel like taking a break, I take a break. I have an idea on a Saturday, I work on it. It's all me. Productivity is still important. I'm not a, a hippie up here saying, we should all be in the park all day with our dogs having fun. The work is more important. The work has to get done. And I was nervous when the pandemic hit because this was the big test. For years, I've been saying, I've been saying remote work is great. I've been saying the most productive member of your team is wearing pajamas. And people always laughed at that and they said, it's true. We have this one remote worker. He or she kills it. And when the pandemic hit, it was the big test. And if I saw a bunch of studies that said, remote workers aren't as productive, my, my um, coding team used to do 10,000 lines a week. At home, they're doing 7,000 li lines a week. I would say, hey, I was wrong, everyone. Forget about Freedom Park. We're getting back to the office because the work has to get done. It's not getting done at home. But I'm not hearing that. I'm hearing the opposite. I'm hearing that, for the most part, it's always exceptions, people are more productive at home. So this is something we have to embrace. It is, it is a good thing. Now, being at home, it kind of actually gives us an advantage in the old days, I did better work at the office. It's not just that I did better work at the office, I had to be at the office. My, the three things I needed, my tools, my files, and my people were at the office. I could take the laptop home, I had Excel and Word on the laptop, I could do a little work on the weekend, but it wasn't as good. Today we have the cloud, it is as good. My tools on my home computer are just as good as my tools at work. My files are on OneDrive, I have just as much access to them, and my people are all in team chat with me. So I have my people, I have my files, I have my tools. I can work just as well at home, especially when I'm doing individual work, when I'm working on a spreadsheet, when I'm writing an article. And we have another advantage, which is a, a presentation I'm doing tomorrow on meeting equity. We actually look better at home. This is uh, uh, the virtual I said I use when I'm on Zoom or Microsoft Teams. And when the pandemic started, a lot of people said, David, help me out with Zoom. You look so good on Zoom and I look like a slob. No one asked me that anymore. Everyone figured it out for themselves. You know, we used to have the up the nose shots and the, the forehead shots and, and the sitting on the couch shots and the bad lighting shots. Everyone looks like a newscaster now. We all look great. In the meeting rooms, we're still figuring it out. We have some meeting rooms that are a big bowling alley. You're at the end of it. You're tiny. You can't be seen. Luckily, the vendors are, are we'll discuss in tomorrow's session, coming up with solutions for that. But you might not be as effective in the meeting room as you are at home. One trick I do at home when I'm in a Zoom meeting, I have my second screen on Google. And something comes up, I Google it, and a few minutes later I say, oh, by the way, that was in 1975, not 1974. And people say, David, you're so smart. How do you know all this stuff? I'm cheating. I have two screens. I'm using Google in Google Meetings. It's harder to do that in a meeting room. It's harder to do in the office. So we do have an advantage of being at home. But there's still something about being at the office. There's one thing that I miss. I, I, much as I love working at home, I miss it. The one thing that earns my commute is the people. Seeing people face to face is better than seeing people. As much as I love video, better than seeing, better than being on Zoom is seeing people face to face. And I miss the water cooler. I miss the hallway conversations. Uh, that's the way you earn my commute. And not, you have to come in nine to five every day because the people are going to be there nine to five every day. It doesn't earn my commute that I'm sitting at my desk and my colleague is sitting at her desk three feet away working on her individual stuff. No, when we're working together, that that earns my commute. And that brings me in. And this is the thing that's missing from home, the social aspect. This is the thing that we have to, that we have to fix. And by the way, earning the commute could be a lot of things. Mark Zuckerberg says, if you want to work for Meta, you've you got to go into the office now. He's bringing everyone back. If my dream is to work for Meta, I guess that earns my commute. I have to work for him. I have to commute. But for the most part, give me a reason. I'd rather sit at home and be productive for nine hours than sit in a car for an hour and be just as productive at, at the office. But without the people, now let's get into the, the, the real point of this presentation. What are the challenges of working at home? And two of the biggest challenges, and this is kind of flip sides of a coin, are burnout and boredom. And I think a lot of that stems from the lack of the social aspect. As much as I hate that switch in my head I talked about earlier, oh, it's nine o'clock, turn the switch, now I am worker David, it's five o'clock, now I'm David again. There was something about that switch that helped me because at five o'clock, Everyone stands up from their desks and leaves. I don't feel guilty about stopping working. Everyone else stops working. At home, it doesn't matter if it's five o'clock, nine o'clock, midnight. 
I never feel like I should stop working because there's a client waiting for something. I feel guilty when I stop working, so I get burnt out. And the other side of that is boredom. I wake up at nine sometimes and without, you know, when I go to the office, everyone else is sitting and working. Oh, it must be time to work. I'm sitting alone. I don't feel like working on this project. I don't feel like working on that. I can't get started. It's hard to get started. So these are two problems, and I think they're, the, the, the cure to them is, is socialization. Uh, this is a little slide I put in for fun. Does anyone recognize this image? This is from a movie from the 70s called Altered States. And when, I, and when I was a young boy, I really loved science fiction, and I read a lot of science fiction. So my parents, oh, this is a science fiction movie. They let me watch it when I was way too young to watch it. And I was a little traumatized by it. The premise of the movie is that this guy puts himself in an isolation tank. He's in a little tube soaking in water and he can't hear anyone, he can't see anyone. He's as alone as a person can be. And it drives him so crazy that he doesn't just go crazy in his head, his body starts changing and at the end he's bouncing off the walls with really bad 70s CGI turning color and stuff. And it, as a little kid I'm like, it's not good to be too alone. And, and I don't want us to be alone. I don't want us to be, everyone's working at home and no one ever talks to anyone. We're all just altered states going crazy, or like in the Matrix when there's little battery pods. I don't want that. Um, so we need to figure out our socialization at home, and a big part of that is setting our boundaries. And I made sure to have two images. At first I just had the guy, but the guy's saying no. I also want someone saying yes. And there's two sets of boundaries you have to set. You have to set your home boundaries with your family, and you have to set your worker boundaries, which is harder, with your team. Home boundaries is easy. It's, it's, and again, there's no right way. Some of you might say, family, nine to five, pretend I'm downtown, pretend I'm at the office, do not come in here. You'll mess up my flow, I can't work. I, I like to be interrupted. I have, my, my home office actually used to be a patio, so the door to my home office is glass. So even if I shut it, my wife can see me. It's not a privacy door. But we've set up a system, I shut the door if I'm recording, because she doesn't want to walk in, I'm in the middle of a video, I gotta start all over again, or if I'm in a Zoom meeting. And sometimes if I'm writing and I'm like, Ooh, I, I really don't want to lose my flow, I'll shut the door just to let her know I don't want to be interrupted. But the way I am, 90% of the time, the door's open. I want her to interrupt me. I need a break. I need socialization. It energizes me. So whatever is right for you, the point of this presentation, I'm not saying this is how you should do it. I'm saying think about it. Talk to your family. Figure it out. Do what works for you. The harder part is setting the boundaries with your team. And I had a lot of struggles with this with my team. I wanted to feel like a team. I didn't want to feel like I have some contractors that I send emails to and they do things for me. I wanted them to believe in my company, let's do video. I wanted them to feel like they're a part of it. One thing I did at one point was having daily meetings. Maybe that works for some people, it didn't work for us. They didn't like it, it was awkward, it was forced, it was too much. Uh, a lot of our contacts now are on chat. We, we elevate, I see video as an elevation of, of chat. Hey, we gotta get some work done, let's do video. That's why I named the company that way. But even with chat, we had some problems. There was one member of my team, she kept all her notifications on. She built the website. If the website crashes, she's the only one who can fix it. So she didn't like the idea of turning off the notifications over the weekends and missing me saying, hey, the website's crashed. So I didn't know that, and I'm working at 3 a.m. on a Sunday and saying, hey, I have an idea for Monday, let's do this, and it's buzzing by her head and waking her up. And she's too nice to tell me it slipped in a meeting. I said, wait a minute. The phone's buzzing by your head when I'm, and she's like, yeah. I'm like, turn off your notifications. She says, no, I'm not turning off my notifications. What if the site goes down? We came up with a solution that works for us. We have a bat channel in, the, in our chat. We have all these different channels. We have channels for sales, for marketing, whatever. The bat channel, she leaves the notifications for that one on. I've never used it. But if the site goes down, I'll put a message in there and she'll get it. And now she's comfortable turning off her notifications. A lot of it is chat. Uh, we try to recreate that water cooler. You can have a chat channel called water cooler. Encourage your team to chat in there. Encourage your team to escalate to video in there. Try to make up for what, we're, what we've lost by not going to the office. Another big part of not burning out is breaks. Obviously, you don't have to be a genius to figure out, hey, instead of just taking a 15 minute break in the morning and a 30 minute break for lunch, I can take breaks whenever I want. Again, if that works for you, some people, David, don't do this to me, I gotta work nine to five, I can't stop or I'll lose everything. But for a lot of us, the breaks are good. Um, and whatever your break is, golf, taking a walk, going to the park, playing guitar, make it accessible to you. I used to keep my guitar in the closet. 
at the end of the day, I would sometimes take it out of the closet and do a half hour of practice and put it back in the closet. I didn't get, I didn't get very good that way. Now I took it out, it sits next to me during the day. After a call, I'll pick it up and play for two minutes and then put it down. It clears my head. It's work-life blend, not work-life balance. And, and this, I think, is going to be, I'm going to give, this is, I think, the best tip of, of this presentation. This is something that really, really, really worked for me. It doesn't work for everyone. I've done videos about this. I get so excited about this. Uh, the image at the right, see that little red thing? It's hard to see. It's a tomato timer. We used to have them in our kitchens. Little timers that look like tomatoes. The Italian word for tomato is pomodoro. And someone came up with something they called pomodoro productivity. And oh, man, does it work for me. And what you do is you set the timer for 25 minutes, and you say, I could do 25, no matter how lazy or, or, or you know, ADHD or whatever is going on in my head, David, can you do 25 minutes? Yes, I could do 25 minutes. Set the tomato, I use a virtual timer, work for 25 minutes, and here's the key, when it beeps, set the timer for a five minute break and stop. Because you're training your brain that when I do a tomato, it's only gonna be 25 minutes. And this really works with big projects. Little projects are easy. Oh, I gotta edit a video. I edited it, I put it up on YouTube. Oh, I gotta respond to an email. When I need to write a white paper, a 20 hour white paper, I'm not gonna get anything done on that today. I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow. And then it's like, where's my white paper? But I could do 25 minutes of the white paper. I'll just do the outline. I'll do a rough draft of the introduction. And then I take my five minute break. Am I up for another tomato or not? Yeah, you know what, I could do another tomato. This really works for me, and I've evolved it into, again, we're talking about trying to get our teams back together, the socialization. I do team tomatoes. We get on Zoom, we mute, we minimize, so I just see a little thumbnail of my team. And I said my team didn't like the daily meetings, they don't need David every day. They love the tomatoes, I thought they would hate it, they love it. I set the timer for 25 minutes, when it stops, I say, hey everyone, five minute break, and they go, okay, this is great, I got so much done. I say, ah, I don't want to push you all. You up for another tomato? Yeah, we should do more of these, David. My team is excited about working with me just because of this silly little um, thing that we do. And I'm not saying the world needs to start pomodoroing, but research productivity techniques, find what works for you and your team, because this has been a, a big game changer for me. So we're talking about burnout, but another topic of this, uh, the title of the taste presentation um, is dealing with video fatigue. Everyone, I hate Zoom, I hate Microsoft Teams, I hate looking at meetings all day. Video, t t and, I, and I say, so what is the problem? And when they list out what they hate about these meetings, it's nothing to do with the video. The camera doesn't hurt my eyes, the screen doesn't hurt my eyes, the, the, the headphones don't hurt my ears. It's, we spend 20 minutes talking about nothing and I have stuff to do. This meeting could have been an email. Uh, my boss just likes to talk. We don't need my boss to talk that much. It, it, all the problem, there was no agenda. Why isn't there an agenda for this meeting? Why are we having this meeting? So fix your meetings. Don't go searching, Googling, how do we fix video fatigue? Google so many wonderful articles out there for years. How do we fix meeting fatigue? Run your meetings better. Less meetings, uh, more organized meetings, have an agenda. And I, I feel like it's a simple answer. This is supposed to be the main topic of this uh, presentation is how do we fix video fatigue? Run your meetings better. It, it really is that simple. Um, now here's a concept I really love. Have, have any, any of you heard of the concept of a desire path? Desire paths, I love desire paths. So when this intersection was designed, the engineers built a wonderful sidewalk. You could rollerblade on it, you could skateboard on it, you could walk smoothly on it without tripping, and they want everyone to walk to the corner and walk along the sidewalk. And what the people want to do is they want to cut across. And what I love about it is look how organic that is. No engineer designed that. It's not a straight line. There's no angles. It's a curve. And look how wide it is. It's as wide as it needs to be. That's how many people walk across it. And this is kind of a comment for the larger AV community. This isn't just about meeting fatigue and, and, and remote working. Is what we used to do is we used to tell our workers, you're using a desire path. Uh-uh-uh. We're putting up a fence. We're going to plant the seeds back down. We're going to put up a sign that says, no, walking on the grass. And we're going to make you walk on the path. Our, our, our CIOs bought the technology and they said, guess what, everyone using WebEx. And we all said, okay, boss, you want me to use WebEx? I'm using WebEx. That's, that's, that's what you paved down. Two things changed this. One is the iPhone and the other, I think, is Slack. Because people started using those things even when the boss said, don't use those things. Too bad, we're using it. We're using it. 
And so things changed. And the philosophy now isn't to block off the desire pass. The philosophy now is what colleges do. College, a lot of colleges, they lay down grass on the quad, they let the students walk across for a semester or two, and then they pave over the desire paths. They said, you chose the way you want to walk from this building to that building. And you could see some are narrow, some are thicker, depending on how much traffic there is. No engineer made this, no AI made this. This is so organic. And you've all seen this on college campuses. This is what I want the AV community to do. If the AV community is saying, if, if, if your team is using Slack, your team is using Zoom chat, your team is using Discord or whatever, all right, if that's what you want to use, we're going to make it work for you. Um, and this applies to home workers as well. Let people work the way they want to use, use the tools they want to use. They're not going to feel as burnt out. They're not going to feel as unhappy. They're not going to feel like I'm on my boss's time doing things my boss's way. They'll be invested in their projects. Um, my final thoughts, this slide, I just, it, it's a little off topic, but I put it in because I just love this slide, and it kind of does apply. Now, the instinct is to make fun of these guys because they have a problem, which is the sun's getting in their eyes, and oh, if they only had a tool that would keep the sun out of their eyes. If they only had some sort of maybe hat that had a visor on it that would block the sun. Um, and they have this tool, but they're using it wrong. So we laugh at them. And I'm not laughing at them. They're not doing it wrong. Their job isn't to be hat technicians. Their job is to go to the ballpark and watch the game and have a good time. That's what they're supposed to do. I blame the hat industry. I blame the hat integrators. I blame the hat distributors. They should be educating. They should make sure that people know how to wear their hats. And the same thing for everyone here. I, I see, a lot of time in meeting rooms, I see these wonderful tools. The vendors put so much work into them. They put them in the meeting rooms, and the cameras now can, can zoom in on the people and do this, and no one's using them because they're all wearing their hat backwards because they haven't been trained. They haven't been shown how to do it. And they'd be so much happier. These tools are great, especially these new meeting room things we're coming up with. Um, so this is just something to, to keep in mind. I, I guess just the final thought is, um, you know, everything I said here today, I'm just trying to get you guys thinking. I, 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 it's not, okay, David said I have to use Pomodoro and I have to use Team Chat. It's, I need to think about my team. I need to think about my remote workers. I need to think about the way I'm re working remotely. It's not just, okay, I don't go to the office anymore. It's different. So think about it and make it work for you.